Hello and welcome to the Ebron 9. Today we're going to do some packing. Well, I've kind of already done, so I can explain the process. But we're going to use one of my favourite tools. Ah, the humble Raspberry Pi. It isn't particularly edible, nor does it taste nice, but it's great for little projects like this. Which you can't, well, you can do them on a Windows PC, but it's less fun. So, shall I get down to the basics of how we reverse engineered and read data from the little EEPROM they use for the printer chip in the Reich SP201N printer, aka my laser printer, which I bought for 40 quid in Tesco, which is a good bargain price. And with this sort of stuff, you can get the prices down of cartridges from 16 quid, even from 17 quid for the whole tone refill kit, to the cheapest damn toner you can buy on the internet, because you can reprogram these chips. They aren't right protected. So, shall we get to the stage of how we reverse engineered them? Excuse the crudity of this model, I do not still have capture co software on this computer. So first off, we've got a standard, let's get more light on it, a standard 8-pin setup for your standard EEPROM. You've also got only four pins, which means this can either be one of two things, either serial or I squared C. That limits it to really two possible chips that are quite commonly used in this sort of work. You've got the humble 93CXX chip and a camera that can't focus to save its life. There he goes. It's figured it out. Which is a humble little chip it is. And I built a reader for it many years ago that works. Plugs into the parallel port of DOS computers and whatnot. And the other candidate was, of course, the 24C32. Now, first off, finding the negative was not difficult. It's the positive, it's not difficult. It's the same on both, which gave a good reference. But I found the negative and positive... The positive matched the positive of the 24CC24 chip. And the negative also did. So that put it here. But the real killer was when I continuity checked the two data lines down here at the bottom of the chip. Which if we flip it round would be get a pointer. Would be these two bottom ones here, they ended up continuity testing quite nicely to pin 1 and 2, aka 1 and 2, which pretty much confirmed it was a 24C chip, and then it was just a matter of comparing it with the schematic to there. Pin 7, tied to ground, means it's not in right protective mode. I think you tie it to positive to put it into right protective mode. So the next case was actually, seriously, it's literally that easy. Find your positives and negatives. Think of what sorts of chips. It's a nice squared C interface. Then it came, what is compatible that I own, that I have in the house right now, that is compatible with the I squared interface. Ta da! The humble Raspberry Pi, of course, because these things are awesome. Now, Reich, in their utter wisdom, decided to give the I squared C chip a custom part number. The Chinese companies decide to completely scrub the part number off completely with lasers 
but do it so badly you can still just about see it's a 24CO2. Just. But the differences between this and this is really just that. I mean, you can see them quite clearly in the originals, but I decided, well, I could solder to the original chip, but then it would make it difficult to replace it. So I built this lovely little adapter out of some prototyping breadboard, two connectors from an old Nokia mobile phone. I believe it was like one or two generations before the Nokia 3310 one. This little clip is from an old scanner, held the mirror. Didn't take the solder directly, so I had to do this clever solder blob technique but of course it soldered onto the um, helping hands so I had to heat it up and let it drop off. Oh yeah it took a while, label the pins and we have our hardware interface. Then came the tricky part, finding software to actually run it. So the first part was to find a pin out that would connect up the Raspberry Pi to the chip that I could build use to build the bases for my adapter. That was not too difficult. The next real point was configuring it, which was found through this library. I will try and put all these into links for you, but I will link to the Facebook my Facebook page which has all the detail and information and discussions. It goes into a lot more detail than I can here. But you know, you have to go into all these specialist little module files, enable and install stuff. Yeah, relatively complex process. And then it gets you to the stage where you can see the addresses that your I2C chip is on. The next point, after much searching, I eventually found this. I tried the original one first, but it didn't work. This is, if you want to read a nice squared C 24C XX chip, this is the software you need. The other thing did not work. I mean, yeah, being typical Linux, and Linux being typical Linux, I had to wget this and then extract it and Google all that. How to extract the file on Raspberry Pi and then how to compile it on the device and all that. This, the software side of this was actually the bit that took hours. But eventually I was rewarded with this. the actual dump of the chip itself and this is the original one. Eventually the new one arrived in the post. Here we go. And we get quite the comparison of data. Only about half the chip is used. The other half is completely neglected of the 24CO2. For some weird reason when you save the binary files it saves them 255 bytes which is a bit weird but from the 0 all the way down to M is a header type part to the file because that data does not change but the data everywhere else does so you've got a sort of header to the file because file structures, networks they have commonality similarities in the way they are constructed kind of makes sense at the end of the day when you think of why but I was able to read the data from the chip and of course I haven't yet tried it but writing the data to the chip should be a nice easy task now because we can read from it we can manipulate it in other ways we can get dumps we can save the data to binary files which are also on Facebook. I will put in the links and I might actually put all this stuff up to mega upload 
in, because I don't know if Facebook does what Twitter does because Twitter you can view all the posts and that even if you're not a member I don't know if Facebook lets you do that Some someone who's not a member will have to inform me on that but that was the process of basically reverse engineering the chip and boy oh boy it was a challenge but the hardware side was the easy part it was the software side that was the challenge because finding libraries to do all this stuff is quite a challenge links will be in the description I'm going to post them in here so I can find them easily <laughs> it's all the stuff you will need if you're going to try this yourself just be vigilant use Google and find someone like Ash who is also very techy to help you out thanks for watching hope you enjoyed Reverse engineering is a fun show.